God is good, and all the time, God is good. Our first lesson is from Revelation chapter 3, beginning verse 20. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you, and you with me. To the one who conquers, I'll give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has a hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. From John's Gospel, chapter 12, beginning verse 20. Now, among those who went to, up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew told Philip, and went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now, my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. <clears throat> Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come from you, for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Message is entitled, Standing on the Outside and Looking In. It might come as a shock that a preacher would be a shy person, but I've always been very shy. Uh, there have been times in my life where just standing in front of people would terrify me. Uh, I once got spanked when I was in, what, first grade? Because I was too shy to dance with a girl in one of those stupid things the teacher made us do, and I just flat out refused to do it, and well, um, I was just too shy. I got spanked. When I was in college, I actually dropped the same English class three different times because it was mandatory. Um, somehow, though, I graduated and I never took it. Anyhow, um, you had to preach or teach or you had to deliver, you know, a speech in front of closed circuit TV. Pretty much what I'm doing now. And... Uh, it so terrified me, I dropped class. Just the idea of that. Because not only do you have to stand and give a speech in front of the camera, you also had to sit in the classroom and be criticized by about a hundred of you know, other students. Uh, now, I don't know why, but at that time in my life, I was just more than I could handle. But if you think, think that's silly, I was even worse as a teenager. I can remember the very first weekend outing I ever went on with a co-ed uh, canoe trail program. Uh, it was a Boy Scout, Girl Scout group. It was evening. Everybody was gathered around the campfire for the, you know, the stories, the program. Uh, the singing was awesome. Uh, but of course, being a very shy individual, I had my stake my place staked out at the outer circle, just where the firelight just barely reached. And I was there for a reason. That's how I could watch everything from a distance, from a very comfortable distance. But you know, in the 66 years that I've been on this planet, I've discovered something. I've discovered a few things about life. And one of those is that women can be one of life's greatest blessings, as well as life's greatest problems, whatever. Um, women have this uncanny way about them. This sort of radar intuition. 
To let them know when someone's feeling insecure or unsure of themselves or alone. Sandy Clark was such a woman. And somehow she knew that I was shy. I was uncomfortable being around, you know, people. And she saw me on the outskirts of the crowd. And somehow she took it upon herself to remedy the situation. And while I was looking the other way, Sandy actually came up behind me. She blindsided me and she grabbed my hand and she escorted me to the front of the fire ring where she made sure that I would be an active participant in that evening's festivities. And Sandy wasn't a very big woman, but you know, she had a grip like Damascus steel. And she had her hand locked in mine and she wasn't about to let go. And she didn't let go of my hand until she had me sit down right beside her husband who happened to be our leader in, you know, running the, the evening's festivities. Uh, Sandy made sure I was actively involved in the events surrounding, you know, the campfire that night. Now, at the time, I thought it was cruel and inhuman punishment. But now I know that Sandy had a heart of love, and there was a way about her that wouldn't let her sit idly by while someone was on the outside looking in. In our lesson from John's Gospel, even though the scriptures do not go into a whole lot of detail, I believe the evidence is there, if you want to read between the lines, to say that Philip must have been a lot like Sandy. Philip is a Greek name, and while Jesus was teaching, it was very common practice for his disciples to circulate in and around among the crowd, you know, inviting people to, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And the disciples, they sort of served as Jesus' welcoming committee. They made the people feel at home and welcome in Jesus' presence. Now, surely we can surmise that Philip, uh, being of Greek origins, must have, you know, struck up conversation with these, these, these people from his homeland. He knew their language, he knew their culture, he knew their ways. Uh, and above all, he knew their need for a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, because he'd been friendly to them, these Greek travelers felt at ease asking him to take them to Philip's Christ. And I think we can just imagine Philip's enthusiasm in helping, you know, to get the ball rolling. It, it's, it's great when you're part of a solution, when you're part of, you know, a movement, and Philip was. Now, apparently Philip, Philip told him, you know, wait right there uh, while he went to approach Jesus to see if he could get him to meet with these strangers um, because, you know, they weren't from the area. Uh, and seeking to make the strongest case possible, uh, Philip seeks out Andrew. And together, Philip and Andrew, uh, they go to ask Jesus to meet with Philip's new friends from his homeland. Now, I think Jesus' answer might be a little bit puzzling at first. Because he doesn't even seem to answer him at all. Instead, he starts talking about what would soon be happening to him. And he also used their, their news of, of strangers to teach them something about themselves. And he told them, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls in the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now what Jesus was recognizing is that his mission was about to be fulfilled. He had come to save, you know, all the lost. And even although this passage doesn't specifically tell us that Jesus met, you know, with those visitors from Greece, we know that he did. In the book of Revelation, Jesus has said, Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. This was obviously a sign that Jesus had been waiting for. The time would come when all people, you know, would look to him as Savior and Lord. Uh, these Greeks were just the first of all people of every, you know, tribe and nation that would one day call upon his name because Jesus is the Lord of all. Now, Jesus is Lord of all, the Jew, the, you know, the Greek, the Gentile, rich person, the poor person, the righteous, the unrighteous, no one. No one is excluded. All of us are equal in the Lord's sight. 
And even as close as he was to the cross at Calvary, as our Lord and Savior, we can know with absolute certainty that he met with these men. And he did that because he always finds time to meet with those who are lost, who truly are seeking to be found. Now, I personally believe the end times are not going to come until every soul that can be saved will have been saved. As long as there are people seeking the Lord, as long as there are those who are trying to find their way out of this world that is dominated by sin, I don't believe the Father is going to give the word um, for Jesus to return for his bride. That's, that's the gospel according to Art. Um, but lest we think that day could be far off, uh, consider how far so many are falling from the Lord. A quick look at our culture pretty much tells us the vast majority of the masses couldn't care less about a relationship with God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't content for any of us to remain on the outside looking in. And once all have been brought into a circle of light, I believe the end's coming. Now we need to understand, however, that there is a cost to being one of his followers. On TV now, they got a lot of the old reruns. Uh, you get bored, they actually have these TV shows from many years back. Um, anybody, can anybody remember Gracie Allen, who played that scatterbrained wife of, you know, George uh, Burns? Uh, they, they were a comedy team. This is like back in the I Love Lucy era. And anyhow, in, in, in the, the skit, uh, Gracie, she calls a repairman to fix her clock. And her repairman, he fizz, fiddles with it for a while, and then he says, there's nothing wrong with the clock. You didn't have it plugged in. Uh, and Gracie replies, well, I don't want to waste electricity. So I only plug it in when I want to know the time. Isn't that a pretty accurate description of so many of us? We want to save our, our religion for a rainy day. We, we go about unplugged and, and wonder why our lives are so devoid of power. I mean, how sad and how so missing the mark and purpose of our lives as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian faith isn't something to be plugged in when it's convenient or, you know, when it's necessary. The Christian life, it, it's supposed to be a daily existence. There is a cost involved. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And this is the paradox of the Christian faith. It's only by losing ourselves that we actually find new life. Um, it's only by burying all these selfish ambitions, these aims and things that, you know, are really of no use to God. That's what Jesus wants us to understand. The grain that was to fall into the earth was himself. But not just him, but also us. I mean, only as we lose our life are we going to find them. Those that love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Those are the Lord's words. Many years ago, before you know, TV and internet, um, it was common to go for entertainment to big opera houses and whatever, and they'd have programs. Well, an old man and a young man, were on the same platform before this vast audience that had gathered, uh, and they were presenting a special program. And as part of the program, each of these two were going to recite from memory the words of the 23rd Psalm. You know, a lot of us could have been on that program. But the young man, trained in speech, and being from the South, you know, train all the techniques and, and drama. He, he gave in his best flowery tongue the words of Psalm 23. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And he, you know, he, he just goes through it, you know, all these inflections and everything. And, and, and the crowd's eating it up. And then he sits down. And the young man, or the older man, I mean, he even needed a cane to get up to the, you know, up on stage. And in his feeble voice, he repeats the same word from memory. The Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And when he was seated in the crowd, they didn't say a word. It got silent. And they all seemed to be sort of like lost in thought. And in that silence, the young man stands back up and he says, Friends, I, I would like to make this one observation. You asked me to come back and repeat the psalm. But you remained silent when my friend here was seated. What's the difference? Well, I'll tell you. I know the words of the psalm. He knows the shepherd. One was on the outside looking in. The other was on the inside crying out. Now the question for us is, which will we be? And who will all of those outside the walls of this church be? The simple truth is, it's entirely up to us. Now if it's been a while since you spent some time with the shepherd, I would encourage you to spend some time with him today. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, there is no substitute for time alone with you. Yet, Lord, we get so busy. And somehow we think we don't need to be bothered. It's our loss. And it's certainly not your gain. Help us all to spend some time at the feet of our Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.